I hear many people who believe that their doctors deliberately provide them with misinformation about nutrition and drugs. Do many provide poor advice? Yes, but not deliberately. It might surprise you, but even doctors have trouble navigating the maze of misinformation when it comes to separating fact from fiction. Last year, I received this email from a colleague. The medical group she belonged to was actively reviewing her prescribing habits to make sure that each and every one of her diabetic patients was on a statin. In effect, she was being pressured to prescribe statins to all of her diabetic patients, despite her belief that many of her patients would not benefit from this. So she went looking for the evidence, actual scientific papers that would answer this question. And she came across this, an expert review paper which strongly promoted statin prescription for diabetics. And there was no two ways about it. Statins were unambiguously recommended. Basically, it was claimed that taking statins would help diabetic patients live longer. And so she asked me if I could explain the conclusions of this review. And there were six references cited in support of the claim. So I went and had a look at each of them. And the first thing to understand is that for a study to make a claim about something like mortality, it has to actually study mortality. Pretty obvious, really. And three of the six studies cited fell down at this first hurdle. This expert review paper cited them to support something they didn't even look at. And the other three studies did measure mortality, but they didn't get statistically significant results. In other words, the findings could be explained by random chance alone. Not the kind of findings you should be using to determine whether or not a medication is prescribed. Especially a medication that can increase your chance of developing diabetes, as was found by the Women's Health Initiative study. They actually found that the risk of developing diabetes increased by 71% in those taking statins. The recommendation to use a drug known to increase the risk of diabetes and worsen sugar control in those already with diabetes is nothing short of extraordinary. The evidence cited to support this recommendation was anything but. Despite this, this paper has been somewhat influential, having been cited 69 times in the peer-reviewed literature. And this illustrates a major problem in medicine today, eminence-based medicine where expert opinion is relied upon despite often being no more than perpetuation of long-standing myths and falsehoods. Basically, those in positions of authority at venerable institutions exert an undue degree of influence over general opinion. Eminence-based medicine, it should be said, is the direct enemy of evidence-based medicine, which is based on critical appraisal of the best available science. Now, coming back to the email, this doctor was clearly trying to do the right thing, and she knew enough not to necessarily trust expert opinion. Many doctors, however, aren't aware that they've been misled and fed falsehoods during their training. The fact is, even in 2021, most doctors still believe hook, line and sinker the nutritional falsehoods that they've been taught. I saw this myself when I gave a group of junior doctors a short test on nutrition, and they were outscored by my receptionist. And if this reflects the nutritional knowledge level of the average doctor, what hope is there for the general public? They might, for instance, be guided by the food star system, not understanding that it is an absolute joke which is being gamed by industry. Take this cereal, which contains 17% sugar and scored five stars, while this salt-cured salmon scored just 1.5 stars. Is it any wonder people make bad food choices? And just as the public can be misled by the food star system, doctors can be deceived by a lack of openness and transparency in the reporting of data. You may be familiar with the Women's Health Initiative study published in 2006. This massive study of over 48,000 females cost 700 million US dollars. It was designed to definitively determine whether or not low fat diets benefited health. Well, that's not exactly true. You see, the investigators already held the view that low-fat diets would be beneficial, and all they really wanted to do was to prove their hunch. To do this, participants were randomised to either a low-fat or a regular diet, and then followed up for about eight years. Given the size and prominence of this study, its results were published with great fanfare, the lead investigator going on record as saying the findings demonstrate the need 
indeed the benefits of dietary reductions in fat even greater than the 8 to 10 percent studied except the results showed nothing of the sort not that you could figure it out if you read the results table or the conclusion no to get to the truth you had to go to page 661 of the journal in which it was published and there in obscure text was the only statistically significant finding of the whole study the only finding not likely due to chance alone the finding was that those randomized to the low fat diet did worse those with a history of heart disease who were randomized to the low fat group had a 26 percent higher chance of complications like heart attacks how was this finding from a publicly funded 700 million dollar study kept hidden from public view how were the researchers able to conclude that this study didn't just support low-fat diets but supported low-fat diets even more extreme than what they studied the way the results were presented was flat out deceptive leading doctors and scientists and ultimately the public the world over to believe this study provided evidence for low-fat diets you may have also heard of the sydney diet heart study a good quality randomized control trial examining in men who'd had heart attacks the effect of replacing saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat and the result on whether or not this diet actually reduced the risk of death was actually destined to never be published that's right it was only a stroke of luck that a researcher uncovered the original study data in a basement and was able to decode it and publish it some 40 years after the study was concluded and so in 2013 the results of the sydney diet heart study were finally published in the british medical journal the conclusion reducing saturated fat in the diet and increasing polyunsaturated fats increased the risk of death by 62 percent this is probably one of the most important bits of research you've never heard about and truth be told one that you almost didn't find out about now of course evidence like this which undermines the orthodox view on dietary fat is not going to be unchallenged and indeed it did face a barrage of criticism most of it deceptive and irrelevant the one argument that most often gets repeated is that the 62 percent increased risk of death was due to an increase in trans fat consumption specifically it is claimed that the margarine consumed in the intervention group was high in trans fat and for all intents and purposes this argument is the only justification these saturated fat fearing zealots have for ignoring the harms of polyunsaturated seed oils this argument however is flawed it comes down to the difference between hard and soft margarines hard margarine did back then contain trans fats however the margarine used in the study was miracle brand a soft margarine and clearly advertised as such and soft margarines contained very little if any trans fats and the consumption of biscuits cakes pastries and puddings all of which were often made with trans fat containing hard margarine was expressly discouraged in the intervention group furthermore safflower oil which also contains little if any trans fat was used in the intervention group further displacing other sources of trans fats the upshot of all this is that the trans fat intake of the intervention group almost certainly reduced which leaves us with the uncomfortable truth that the increase in polyunsaturated oils in the diet as recommended by our current dietary guidelines increased the chance of dying by 62 percent all shown by a good quality long-term randomized control trial and the sydney diet heart study is not the only randomized control trial showing the harms of replacing saturated fats with polyunsaturated oils the minnesota coronary survey also completed in 1973 was a gold standard double blinded randomized control trial on more than 9,000 men and women in which a high saturated fat diet was compared with a high polyunsaturated fat diet and again like the sydney diet heart study the results were almost lost to history that is until in a striking case of deja vu the original study data was recovered and finally published in 2016 and again the results mirrored those of the sydney diet heart study reducing saturated fats and increasing dietary polyunsaturated fats increased the risk of dying and there's a footnote here before his death the lead author was asked about the delay in publishing the study findings to which he replied it was because the study findings were disappointing clearly this is not how science should work 
and yet it does. We've just seen two egregious examples of where the truth regarding polyunsaturated oils was almost lost to history, simply because the study investigators didn't like the results. Of course, we still face the problem that even when research is clearly and accurately portrayed, that's either ignored or dismissed without foundation. This paper suffers from both. Despite being published in one of the world's most prestigious medical journals, few doctors I speak to outside of the low-carb sphere have even heard of it. And one reason I suspect it hasn't been widely shared and discussed is that its findings effectively demolish the argument that we should avoid saturated fat because it might increase our LDL levels. It found, in fact, that those with the highest LDL levels lived the longest. Much easier to pretend this study just doesn't exist. The thing is, this is actually a systematic review, which included every prospective cohort study available to answer the question of what happens to those with high levels of LDL cholesterol. It didn't involve any cherry picking of the data, all suitable studies were included. In fact, it ended up being 19 prospective cohort studies with over 68,000 participants. And collectively, the overwhelming finding was that individuals with the highest LDL levels live longer. In fact, 16 of the 19 studies found this relationship. The higher your LDL level, the lower your chance of dying. Let's now take a closer look at the data from the individual studies. Different studies are represented by rows, with the four columns representing LDL levels. Basically, each column represents a grouping of 25% of the study population based on LDL levels. The left-hand column shows those with the lowest LDL levels, and the right-hand column those with the highest. And the numbers represent relative risk of dying. Numbers less than one indicate a reduced chance of death. And if you compare the chance of death between those with the lowest LDLs and those with the highest LDLs, you'll note that higher LDL levels are clearly associated with a reduced chance of dying. This study, for instance, found that those with the highest LDL levels were 34% less likely to die than those with the lowest levels. This study finding a 47% reduced chance of death in those with the highest LDL levels. And as you look through all the studies, you'll note this is a consistent finding. But still some people reject this finding, claiming that reverse causality might be at play. The concept of reverse causality is basically that illness lowers LDL levels, and so that those with the lowest LDL levels simply mean those who are already ill. Indeed, a drop in LDL level in the last two years of life is well known in the literature. But this argument fails on three levels. First of all, the average period of observation in each of these studies was significantly longer than two years, and still those with the highest LDL levels lived the longest. Secondly, even when study subjects with terminal disease, heart disease, or diabetes were excluded, there was no change in results, not even a weakening of the findings. This study found about a 50% reduction in the chance of death in the highest LDL group, despite these exclusions. And finally, even if we exclude the 25% with the lowest LDL levels, supposedly those with the chronic illnesses, and compare those in the second quartile of LDL levels against those with the highest LDL levels, we still see superior outcomes in those with the highest LDL levels. The fact is, the findings of this systematic review are robust, and dismissing or ignoring the findings is scientifically dishonest. Another common example of what I consider to be an egregious dismissal of scientific evidence is with respect to high fat diets and weight loss. Between 2003 and 2018, there were 62 published randomized controlled trials comparing weight loss on high fat and low fat diets. And of these 62 studies, 31 had statistically significant results, while the other 31 had results which may have been due to chance. And so here, I have graphed the results of the 31 studies with statistically significant results, leaving out the studies whose findings could have been due to chance. The green bars represent the amount of weight loss on a high fat diet, and the adjacent red bar, the amount of weight loss in a low fat diet. And if you look at each pair of results, you'll see that those on high fat diets lost more weight in all of them, all of them. Not a single study found in favor of low fat diets. And despite this overwhelming evidence, 
many doctors still promote low fat diets for weight loss. This is a copy of the handout one of my patients received from another doctor, specifically recommending a low fat diet. When doctors ignore science like this, it's no wonder we have an obesity epidemic. And some doctors can't even bring themselves to question their beliefs when they see patients heal themselves in front of them. Take this 71 year old male patient of mine who amongst other things reversed diabetes, fixed his blood pressure, stopped five medications and put his inflammatory bowel disease into remission, all with dietary change. You'd think his original diabetes doctor who was an endocrinologist would be happy. Well in this letter to me, his doctor acknowledged that the resolution of his diabetes was likely due to this new low carb diet, but then proceeded to recommend he resume the exact type of diet he was on when he developed these multiple medical issues in the first place, despite the patient clearly telling his doctor that he had already tried this recommended diet. And for good measure, the doctor also recommended this diabetic patient take a statin, despite having had side effects to one previously. But there is now some light at the end of the tunnel. For example, the American College of Cardiology, once a bastion of anti-saturated fat recommendations and dogma, has now shifted its opinion. In this recent review paper, it is acknowledged that the weight of evidence does not support restricting saturated fat. Indeed, it is explicitly recommended that dairy, meat and eggs be freely consumed. And to understand the significance of this shift, you need to realise that three of the authors of this article were on the committee that produced the 2005 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, and that includes the chair of the committee. All we need now is for our guidelines and medical education to catch up, or at the very least for doctors to begin to independently appraise the literature for themselves. Now for health professionals who do understand the science but are afraid of recommending against the dietary guidelines, you should know something. On page 2 of the Australian guidelines, it is explicitly stated that the guidelines only apply to those who are healthy, not to those with medical conditions which require specialised dietary advice. And I'm yet to meet a medical condition that could not be impacted by dietary advice. In effect, if you're providing nutritional advice to manage diabetes or obesity, the dietary guidelines need not apply.